Yep, start. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. On behalf of myself, Lynn Julius, and uh, my husband, Lawrence here, the technical team, um, I'd like to welcome you all to another lockdown lecture with Kharif. We must be getting on for about 50 of these uh, lockdown lectures, which we started uh, when the health crisis began back oh, uh, about a year ago now. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Harif, we are the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. We have a website called uh, www.harif.org. Uh, to get uh, regular updates, please do sign up to uh, Harif and uh, you will receive the Zoom details for each event a few days beforehand. We don't issue them all at once for security reasons. We also have a um, sister website called Point of No Return, uh, which you can get to quite easily on Google, by, via Google, and that keeps you up to date with the news. Uh, we are live streaming to the Harif uh, Facebook page. Uh, and we are also recording this session and you will be receiving the link in our next email. So tonight, uh, the subject of our lockdown lecture is the four communities, the four Jewish communities of India. Of course, India is very much in the news, very sadly, because of the, the tragic um, consequences of, of the virus there. Uh, but of course, the Jews have got a very special association uh, with, with India. Um, the, there, there were always very few of them uh, in relation to uh, the overall community, but they made a very impressive impact on Indian society. And here to talk to us tonight, I can't think of anyone better qualified than Dr. Maisie Meyer, who herself was born in Calcutta in India and actually speaks fluent Hindi, she was telling me. Uh, Dr. Meyer actually made uh, a speciality out of uh, the Baghdadi Jews of uh, China, and she's written a book about them. Uh, called uh, From the Rivers of Babylon to the Wang Po. And she gave us two lockdown lectures, one on the Jews of Shanghai and one on the um, amazing character, Sir Victor Sassoon. Um, so um, Dr. Mayer has got so many academic qualifications, I can't really list them all, just suffice to say, She's got, she graduated in English and Humanities. Uh, she's got an MA in International History. She's got a PhD from the LSE. And she's been very active giving uh, Zoom lectures, I'm glad to say. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Maisie. Over to you. I'm going Thank to you very much, Maisie. I'm gonna to have to share screen, I guess. Yes, you can, it's all set up for you. Yeah, share screen. Is that okay now? Yeah, it is. You can see my screen because I no, can't. No, no, not yet. Yes, How about now that? we can. Yeah, now that's perfect. perfect. Okay, uh, good evening. I would like to thank Lynn for giving me the opportunity to tell you about the Jewish communities in India. All those, these communities were a minuscule proportion of the subcontinent's population. Their involvement in the development of India, their contribution to Indian society, and the legacy they left in several unexpected spheres is impressive. Let's begin with the Bene Israel, the largest Jewish community. Their origin is shrouded in mystery. Seven Jewish couples are believed to have been shipwrecked on the con. Konkan coast of Western India. I think I'll go back and show you the Konkan coast more than 2,100 years ago. Now, as you see, they were absorbed into Indian culture. 
They had lost all their prayer books and Torah scrolls and were isolated from other Jewish communities. Yet, remarkably, they observed Jewish traditions. They celebrated festivals, but not Hanukkah, leading to the speculation that their in arrival in India predated the destruction of the Second Temple. Now, over the course of several centuries, they forgot Hebrew and spoke Maharati, the local language. They worked as skilled carpenters, merchants, and were mainly oil pressers. They did not work on Sabbath, and they were called oil pressers who take Sabbath off. Now, this gave rise to the theory that they descended from the tribe of Levi, one of the 10 lost tribes of Israel, since oil pressing in biblical times was reserved for the levies who served in the temple. Around the 11th century, David Rahabi, a coaching Jew, suspected these oil pressers were Jewish. He tested the women by displaying two types of fish in front of them and asked which ones they cooked. They pointed to fish with fins and scales, which is how we Jews differentiate kosher fish. Rahabi realized that they were Jews and taught them the tenets of Judaism. The, the Ben Israel divided their community into two groups, the Gora, which means white, where both parents were Jewish, and the Kala, black, was a smaller group where only one parent was Jewish. These two groups prayed together, but the Goras didn't allow the Kalas to touch their religious books. They didn't accept the Kalas as bona fide Jews and they did not marry them. In 1674, the British East India Company moved its headquarters to the islands of Bombay. And this is Mumbai today. Uh, by the mid 18th century, Bombay developed into a metropolis Busy port, a busy port city attracting thousands of Indians from the countryside, including hundreds of Bene Israel. Although most of the community remained in villages, many were tempted by employment and educational opportunities in Bombay. They enlisted in the native forces of the British East India Company and later the British government's military service. And you see the proportion of enlistment of of decoration for bravery and a promotion to the highest rank was extremely high among Beni Israel. India's Beni Israel are unique among diaspora communities because surprisingly, it was a Christian missionary, Wilson, who introduced Hebrew as a subject for higher education. Using Wilson's book of Hebrew Marathi grammar as a first step, some pupils became proficient in Hebrew. In due course, they taught Hebrew in Wilson School and universities. They also studied English and secular subjects in Wilson School. Their literacy in Hebrew and in English enabled them to communicate and maintain contact with mainstream Jewry. Many Israel scholars published Mahar, Mahar, Marathi translations of classic Hebrew text, Jewish prayer books and rabbinical commentaries. Each Hebrew text was accompanied by a parallel translation into Marathi, for the first time giving Beni Israel access to a wide range of Jewish texts. It is astonishing that during a century of concentrated efforts to convert them to Christianity, various missionaries met with almost no success at all. In 1826, a group of dedicated coaching Jewish teachers came to live among them in Bombay and teach them about Jewish observance. And this is Bombay's oldest Venus Rose synagogue, Shari Rahamin. Now, Beni Israel synagogues were founded and each became a center of religious, social, and communal life. Hakam Shlomo Salim Srabi, a Cochin Jew of Yemenite origin, served as a Hazan, a Shohet, a Hazan, I think everyone knows as a candidate, Shohet and Mohel, who performed circumcisions. I think you'd like to have a look at the synagogue in Penn. And this is another one in Ahmedabad. These were all Ben Israel synagogues. 
and that you wonder what is. And I think he liked that picture. I think his son has was just bar mitzvah. Um, now these just take a look at these pictures of of wedding ceremonies, and, and you, you'll notice how they're getting more and more anglicized as we go on here. It's very noticeable. Uh, that's a cemetery, and here we have a geniza, uh, books and other sacred objects which can no longer be used, but which may not be destroyed or placed in a geniza. Now, two main factors contributed to community's dispersal. Under British colonial government, educated Ben Israel were favored for civil service positions and relatively large numbers in the government police services, the army, navy, merchant marine, and in the 20th century in the Air Corps. These careers tended to involve permanent or temporary postings far from Ben Israel centers. The transition from rural to urban centers in Bombay, Ahmedabad, Karachi, and Aden transformed the community into a professional one. In Bombay, Ben Israel worked mainly in construction, in shipyards, and as carpenters. Many became lawyers, doctors, and teachers. Several became high-ranking officers in the army, police, and administrative services. Among the most distinguished was, was Vice Admiral Benjamin Samson, who was the head of India's Western Fleet during the 1965 Indo-Pakistan War. And Dr. El Elijah Moses, a physician and mayor of Bombay from 1937 to 38. Unlike Jewish communities elsewhere, Ben Israel Jews never experienced anti-Semitism. They were quite naturally incorporated into the caste system. The plural pluralism of India nurtured them. In 2002, British historian Jua Parfit administered DNA test on the Bene Israel community. His results made front page news in the Sunday Times of India. Maharati Jews are Moses' kin, says study. Reuters reported extensive DNA testing has found the Bene Israel clustered in and around the western city of Bombay are direct descendants of a hierarchy Israelite priesthood that can be traced, I'm sorry, of a hereditary um, Israelite priesthood that can be traced back 3,000 years to Aaron, the brother of Moses. I find this delicious irony. At this acknowledgement that they were not just Jews, but those belonging to the priestly class was a massive boost for the Ben Israel, especially since their history, identity, and Jewish purity has been constantly questioned. At the end of, of the 1940s, the Bene Israel population in India peaked to about 25,000, with India's total population at 350 million. After 1948, many began emigrating, mainly to the cities, to the new state of Israel. And they were motivated by a sense of Jewish identity and concern over their economic prospects in newly independent India. Large scale emigration from the villages did not occur until the early, uh, the early 1970s. Since then, the total number of Bene Israel remaining in India, almost all in the urban centers, remains about 5,000. The immigration to Israel was marked by tension for a few decades. Some rabbis objected to them marrying other Jews on the grounds that the Bene Israel could not have been, they could not have properly observed rabbinic law governing marriage and divorce. In 1964, however, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, Yitzhak Nassim, who happens to be a Baghdadi Jew, declared them full Jews in every respect, but refused to allow them to marry other Jews until they provided proof of their Jewishness and that they had not been tainted over several generations. The rabbinate re reserved the right to decide the legitimacy of individual marriages. The Ben Israel faced extensive questions about their ancestry and had to furnish documents, even photographs of family graves. Hundreds protested in Jerusalem that the Israelis were claiming that Indian Jews 
were tainting their blood. Their absorption was made difficult because they were discriminated against because of their darker skin color. They were allotted inferior homes built of asbestos and tin, and several regretted leaving India. Many are much happier today and intermarried between Jews from various communities is now common. Several hold prestigious jobs in the government and private sectors. While they do not teach their children Hindi or Mar Marathi, many want to maintain their links to India. They continue to play cricket. Now this, I have to show you, wearing the Indian team sports. Uh, cricket is a very important game in India and, and they didn't forget it when they were in Israel. Now the Bene Israel enthusiastically watch Bollywood films and profess India is our motherland and Israel our fatherland. Israel is our heart, India is our blood. Every Indian Jew will say that we are both Israeli and Indian. I said, that says a lot, doesn't it? However, the younger generation, Ben Israel, feel more and more Israeli. They have opened Indian restaurants around across the country. And in 1944, Israel's Ben Israel population was estimated to be 40,000. Okay, now let's move on to coaching Jews. The Cochin Jews are known as Malamad Jews or Cochinim. After the, after the destruction of the Second Temple in 68 CE, about 10,000 men and women came to the Malabar coast. That's a lot, 10,000. They settled in the kingdom of Cochin in South India, now part of the state of Kerala. And they developed Judea Malayam. I never get this right. Malay Yalam language. As early as the 12th century, the traveler Benjamin of Tudela wrote, throughout the island, including all the towns thereof, live several thousands Israelite. The inhabitants are all black and the Jews also. The latter are good and benevolent. They know the laws of Moses and the prophets and to a small extent, the Talmud and Halacha. The Paradisi Jews, also called white Jews, settled in Cochin in the 16th century, escaping from forced conversion and religious persecution in Spain and then Portugal. They retained their Sephardi cultural distinctions and were, and therefore there were resulting tensions between the two ethnic communities. The Paradisi spoke Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish, Ladino, which is Judeo Spanish, and in time, Judeo Malayalam. These languages were useful in conducting international trade. In the late 19th century, a few Baghdadi speaking Jews who became known as Baghdadis joined the Paradisi community. Let's see some pictures of the Cochin Jews. Two, two members of family. Here's another family. Two women. And then we have the children. I like this picture saying the Shema. That's so universal for Jews, isn't it? That one. And there again, the shofar. Cochin Jews maintained a close relationship with, in, with the Indian rulers. This was codified on a set of copper plates granting the community special privileges. And these they, the, are inscribed with the date 379. BCE, so just have a look here. During the visit of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon in India in 2003, he was presented with a replica of the copper plates and Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India presented a similar replica to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu during a state visit to Israel in 2017. Now, Indian rulers granted Jewish leader Joseph Rabban the rank of prince over the Jews of Cochin, giving him the control of tax revenue and other privileges. The Hindu king gave permission, and I'm quoting, as long as the world, sun and moon endure, for Jews to live freely, build synagogues and own property without conditions attached. Rabban's descendant, led the community until the dispute broke out between two brothers 
in the 16th century. In 1341, a disastrous flood silted up the port of Shanganor and trade shifted to a smaller port of Cochin. Many of the Jews moved quickly and within four years had built their first synagogue in Parpul, believed to be on the site of the former synagogue built in 1165. Almost every member of this community emigrated to Israel in 1954. Their absorption was made more, was made difficult because they would just know, I'm going to have to just show you that synagogue, that the Tekabam synagogue here uh, was built by Malabari Jews nearly 300, sorry, three and a half centuries later. It started deteriorating and it was demolished in the 1930s and reconstructed. Five families who were members of this congregation still lived in Kerala or in Madras in 1998. Here's the old Paradesi Synagogue. Is this the one I think that Harry might recognize? Now, in the early 20th century, Abraham Barak Salem, a young lawyer descended from the Mishukrakim, became known as Jewish Gandhi. He worked to end discrimination against Mishukrakim and reconcile the divisions among Cochin Jews. And by the mid 1930s, many of the old taboos had disappeared with a changing society. You see some more of the synagogue that's in Cochin. Cemetery. Majority of the Cochin Jews settled in Israel when the state was established as a nation in 1948. Most of the Malabar Jews joined the Moshavin agricultural settlements of Net Nevatin and Netzilat Sion. Others settled in the neighborhood of Katamon in Jerusalem and in Beersheba, Ramla, and Dimona, where many Ben Israel had settled. In contrast, most of the Paradisi Jews preferred to migrate to Australia and other Commonwealth countries. Among the eight synagogues that survived to the mid 20th century, only the Paradisi synagogue has a congregation and attracts tourists. And I was one of them, and I think Harry as well, Harry and Angela. So we were the tourists there. And you've seen also Jews Town. And at the peak in 90, at, it, at its peak in the 1950s, there were a total of 250 Jews in thriving Jew Town community. Most emigrated to the newly founded state of Israel. Today, only six elderly Paradisi Jews remain. I need to see another road sign. Uh, Sarah's Embroidery Shop is the only authentic Judaic shop left. Its windows are decorated with Jewish stars of David. A former coach in Jewess reports that the middle-aged Muslim shopkeeper explained that Sarah Cohen, the elderly Jewish owner who sadly died last year, made shawls and headscarves for the community's ceremonies and eventually opened her shop in the 1980s. Her hands began to shake too much, so Ibrahim took over. He's teaching others the embroidery skills she taught him. Here's some more pictures. In December 2018, the Paradisi Synagogue celebrated its 450th anniversary. It was attended by many former Cochin Jews from all over the world. And the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi extended her congratulations. Now let's turn our attention to the Baghdadi Jewish community of Bombay. The earliest evidence of a Baghdadi Jewish settlement is in the port of Surat. It spawned the two most important Baghdadi communities in Mumbai and Kolkata. There was a small community of Baghdadi merchants in Bombay as early as the 18th century. 
this nascent community did not come into its own until David Sassoon, fleeing persecution in Baghdad, arrived in 1833. And this is his father in Baghdad, a very aristocratic looking gentleman. And this is David Sassoon. His garment and headdress add to his impressive appearance. And he never gave up wearing them. He founded a vast commercial empire in a wide selection and dealing in a wide selection of merchandise. And I'm going to quote uh, silver and gold, silks, gums and spices, opium and cotton, wool and wheat, whatever moves over sea or land, feels the hand or bears the mark of Sassoon and company. That says it all. Perhaps his greatest asset was his family of 14 children, including eight sons from two marriages, and they became his valuable agents. And this is Fakhra, his second wife, who was, uh, his first wife died. Uh, she was only 11 years old at the time of the marriage. The Sassoon firm especially employed Jews from Baghdad as clerks, and Judy Arabic was a media of communication. This is... Now, for convenience, the term Baghdadi encompasses Jews from Syria and other parts of the Ottoman Empire, Aden and Yemen, and all of whom spoke Arabic, and also Jews from Persia and Afghanistan who did not. So that's all under the umbrella of Baghdadi Jews. Increasing number of Baghdadi Jews came to India to escape conscription and persecution, confident that they would find employment in the Sassoon firm. They were attracted by Bombay stability under the British Raj and religious freedom and not least rich trading potential. Baghdadi Jews played a significant intermediary role as ancillaries of the British in enabling Bombay, Calcutta and other East Asian cities to develop into some of the greatest import and export financial centers of the world. In time, there were flourishing communities of Baghdadi Jews in Bombay, Calcutta, the capital and commercial hub of British India. Several had monopolies of merchandise like pepper, spices, indigo, timber, cotton goods, and precious stones. And some engaged as contractors, gunpowder manufacturers, shipbuilders, and several had a high profile in the stock exchange. The challenge that confronted this immigrant group was to forge trading relationships while maintaining their Jewish identity. With remarkable resilience, they adapted to their new surroundings. They merged to an astounding degree in economic and social spheres, worked harmoniously with varying, various trading posts in India, with Christians, Muslims, Parsis, Hindus, and other native merchants. Many had a Hindu or Muslim as their agent, partner, or associate. They coexisted with other religious groups and adapted to diverse cultures. They flourished and enriched their adopted country. Here you see David Sassoon with three of his sons. Uh, when I was at a conference in Vienna, I was asked if David was, was the butler. But in fact, uh, it was a um, Solomon Sassoon, his descendants meticulously maintained Baghdadi religious traditions. In Bombay, Baghdadis encountered the Bene Israel and the Cochin Jews. Unlike their co religionists, the Baghdadis seemed to have been unaffected by the culture or creed of their Indian neighbors. They had misgivings about the purity of descent and religious observance of the Bene Israel and discouraged marriage with them. Acculturation to the British and racial barriers promoted by colonialism led the Baghdadis to keep apart from the Bene Israel as they felt that association with them might lower their own social status. The Baghdadi pragmatists in which to identify with their British rulers in the hope of achieving political security and social privilege. After all, they had arrived in India when Britain was politically dominant and all that was Western seemed worthy of emulation. David Sassoon's family laid the foundation to preserve their religious tradition and Baghdadi culture in India. Then they donated the iconic Margam David Synagogue in 1864. And we have here some more pictures of this magnificent synagogue. 
which still uh, I have visited on several occasions, kept in, in pristine condition by trust. Here we go. It's another synagogue, the Knesset Eliyahu. You can see the wonderful stained glass windows. It was established in 1884 by Jacob Elias Sassoon, the grandson of David Sassoon. And there's a congregation. And we see an extensive grounds of the synagogue. Now here, um, within the extensive grounds of the synagogue, there are two Jewish schools operated by Sir Jacob Sassoon High School Trust. You see the school children. And also we have schools uh, which were donated by Sir Ellis Kaduri and he was from Hong Kong. And uh, there we see a picture of Elias uh, Kaduri and his uh, there was Sir Eli Kaduri also from Shanghai and Hong Kong, and they have donated these schools here. And that's, over time, most of the Baghdadi Jews moved to more affluent Kolaba area or abroad to Israel, Australia, Britain, and Canada. With the scarcity of Jewish students, the schools have opened to all communities. Today, they remain in pristine condition owing to the trust that generous benefactors set up. The pupils are 98% Muslim. So soon philanthropy extended to the wider community and contributed significantly to the development of Bombay. They were a major force in the, developing the textile industry. And by the, nine, by the end of the 19th century, they represented the largest single conglomeration of mills. With Parsi enterprise, they revolutionized the weaving industry in India enabling Bombay to grow in the second half of the 19th century into an important manufacturing city. The Sassoons were running their own crashes for workers long before the uh, Bombay government made them compulsory in 1939. Workers' children were cared for from 8.30 in the morning until 6.30 in, in the evening. Each child was given a bath, change of clothes and meals. There was a teacher to supervise them. These are but some illustrations of the Sassoon family, incredible contribution to Indian society. David Sassoon left a most effective legacy in the field of education of India's youth, notably the industrial institution and reformatory for juvenile delinquents and the Sassoon High School, which still provides a good standard of education. Seen that here, the Sassoon docks constructed in 1875, the first wet dock in Bombay, vastly stimulated the city's commercial growth. Even today, it is one of the largest fish markets in Mumbai. Memory of the Sassoon's philanthropy lives on through their landmark buildings. After his death, the citizens of Bombay, as a tribute, contributed towards this extremely large statue of him, which you can see today towering over everyone in the Sassoon Library and reading room in Kala Goda. There is also a full-size portrait of him in this library. And here we see some more, the bust of me at here. That palatial residence, the San Sushi, is currently the Messina Hospital. In Pune, with Pune now, the Sassoon General Hospital has an infirmary for destitute invalids, a shelter for leprosy with, uh, victims, and a maternity ward, and also 1,296 beds. And there's his synagogue in Pune, the old David. The imposing clock tower of the, Lal David, of the old David synagogue has been an important landmark for 150 years. Uh, David Sassoon lies buried in the grounds in this mausoleum. And 
Several other Baghdadi Jews, notably says the soon Jacob High David, who partly financed the construction of this, the gateway of India, made significant contributions to Mumbai. Sir David served on the council of the governor general of India on the Imperial Legislative Council and the Bombay Municipal Corporation for 20 years, becoming its head in 1921. And uh, some of you were at my previous uh, Zoom presentation of to know that this is Sir Victor Sassoon, the grandson of Elias, the second son of David Sassoon, who served for several years as a member of the Royal Commission on Labour and the Bombay Legislative Assembly, representing the Bombay Mill Owners Association. He caused a great stir when the great panache he would enter the chamber in a great top hat, a morning coat, with a carnation in his lapel. Although the number of Baghdadi Jews are critically low now, they managed to maintain prayer services in their synagogues to host Sabbath dinners for the congregation and visiting tourists. This keeps alive the, the religion and the cultural legacy of this important minority in Mumbai, Pune, and Kolkata. Now there are only about 5,000 Jews in India. The majority live in Mumbai, where there are about 10 synagogues. Now let's see what we can discover about the Jewish communities of Calcutta. The founder of the Calcutta community, Shalom Aaron Ovadia Hakohen, was born in Aleppo in 1762. He arrived in Surat in 1792 and traded as far as Zanzibar. Nine years later, he settled in Calcutta. In 1805, he was joined by his nephew, Moses Simon Duwe Hakohen, who married his elder daughter, Luna. Hakohen built up a lucrative business in jewelry and precious stones at Lucknow and Amritsar. His factories transformed the city into an international emporium. He was appointed court jeweler to the ruler of Oud and the Maharaja Ranjit Singh of Punjab. Soon the community was swelled by other traders and Baghdadis outnumbered those from Aleppo. Members of the community were concerned about their children who attended mission schools being proselytized. So they opened the Jewish Girls School in 1881 under the direction of EMD Cohen and Elias Meyer Free School and Talmud Torah. And we see the Magandavid Synagogue in Calcutta, which Lawrence I know has been to. I've got loads of these pictures. And I, I, I just point out right, right up there, that's where my, my sisters and my mom and I used to be uh, sitting on Shabbos, on Shabbat. Another picture. The Mark and David Synagogue was built in 1884 by Elias David Ezra, and the upper gallery is reserved for ladies. And you see, this is a Muslim caretaker. And this is a Beth Hill Synagogue, which is quite near the Mark and David, and it was um, donated in 1856 by David Joseph Ezra. But also later on was expanded by Elias Shalom Kape to accommodate the growing Jewish uh, uh, community. And there we see the women up, up in the gallery. Now, this is something that is very exciting. It, the, well, the Torah scrolls, yes, they have these special teaks uh, that are typically Baghdadi. And here is a ceremony. We got over 50 former Calcutta Jews from different parts of the world attended a rededication ceremony of the Mark and David and Beit Hill synagogues on the 17th of December, 2017. It turned out to be the largest gathering of the Indian Jewish community in recent history. The ambassador of Israel was guest of honor. And I think we can see him there, that's him, that's the ambassador. And, um, and you see the students of uh, the girls' school and the boys' school 
singing and and these uh, are singing Jewish songs, you know, which is quite incredible, isn't it? There we go. And with great gusto, really. Now, some Baghdadis, like the Ezra family, rose to prominence to extensive and innovative industrial activities and played a conspicuous commercial role in Calcutta. Joseph Ezra arrived in the city in 1821. He and his sons, David and Benjamin, became involved in exporting indigo and silk to the Near East and opium on a large scale to Hong Kong and Far East. David owned some of the most prestigious buildings in prime locations and he was honored with the title Sheriff. His brother Benjamin exported jute and became one of India's wealthiest businessmen. He created a chain of industrial and commercial concerns with major manufacturing interests in tea, jute, tobacco, bone crushing, advertising and printing. The family had the distinction of having two streets named after them and I tell you, they employed a lot of Baghdadi Jews from Calcutta who worked in their firm. Now, for administrative purposes and to protect their interest, the British government in India made it clear um, that there was a distinction between European and non-European sections of the population. I'll show you some pictures of Baghdadi merchants in, in Calcutta. You can see they had a pretty good life, um, lifestyle, and there's Rabbi uh, Twainer. But the lighter complexion and the ease in integrating and conforming to the dress, language, and education, social habits of the Europeans facilitated this classification because they were classified in the European sections of the population. The Sephardi Jews, excluding the Bene Israel and Khotan Jews, were until 1885 classified as Europeans based on historical and sociological factors and education, dress, social habits. And this accorded them tangible benefits. Salary scales for Europeans were higher than for Indians. Europeans had more business opportunities and easier credit facilities with banks. The term Sephardi, with its European connotations, was the key to Baghdadis being classified as European. They were deaf, therefore very, very disappointed and distraught to find that on our new government ruling in 1885, only those of Armenian and Portuguese origin were granted European status. In their struggle for recognition as Europeans, in June 1990, the Calcutta Safari community implored the government not to force them to submit to legislation intended for Indians. They argued that their lifestyle, habits, customs, traditions, and aspirations were foreign to India. And Sir David Ezra emphasized that the Jews of Bengal were foreigners in India and consequently not permanently domiciled in the country. Nonetheless, the dispute just continued it, in spite of all this. And after years of persistent lobbying, lobbying the Calcutta Baghdadi Jews were excluded from the European electorate in 1935. The British Jews to define them by their religion. Nonetheless, they continued to prosper. And the 21-year-old Nahum Ibn Ezra, for example, I'll, I'll speak about him. He arrived in Calcutta with his two cousins and most importantly, the recipes for delicious Baghdadi confectionery. Initially, he would go to Jewish homes accompanied with a coolie carrying a large box filled with delicacies on his head. His four daughters began to help with the preparation and five sons with sales in time Coolies were no longer able to fill the growing demand and a cart was used instead. And now home then rented a shop. Wait, I have to just show you, this is a newspaper, the Judea Arabic newspaper. I should have showed this to you earlier. Ah, there's a Nahum shop in the new market. That's a Naya Bazaar in Calcutta. In 1912, they opened the shop and the confectionery was prepared in a small factory next door to their home a few hundred yards from the shop. They expanded 
the range to Western patisserie, chocolates, jams, pickles, and here the sons working at David. Um, by the mid 1920s, um, they were employing several workers in the factory and sales and assistance. The sons were actively involved as another son, Isaac, in various aspects of the business. The shop catered beyond the confines of the Jewish community to Europeans, Anglo-Indians, Armenians, Chinese, Indians, and Muslims. Now and Sons, the iconic Jewish bakery, continues trading, but no longer kosher products. It is currently run by the fourth generation descendant of Naum, it's, um, it, uh, of the founder Naum Israel, and his name is Isaac Nahum, who's taken over the mantle from his brothers. My family were very, very friendly with the Nahum brothers and sisters, um, and we used to love going to that shop. Now, in yet another ex unexpected sphere, Baghdadi Jewish, here we see Baghdadi Jewish women were megastars and had a monopoly over leading role film, roles in films. They were the forerunners of Indian actresses. In the early days of filmmaking in India, it was con considered taboo for women to act, and men and young boys played female parts. And she was one of the most. Uh, she was a former telephone operator. In her heyday, the actress Sulakhana Ruby Myers earned 5,000 rupees a month, which was more than the governor of Bombay's salary at the time. <laughs> She's reputed to have owned the first Rolls Royce in India. And just take a look at it. Isn't this extraordinary that the government of India released this commemorative stamp in 2013 to mark the completion of 100 years of Indian cinema? A huge honor for a Baghdadi Jews. She established her own film studios called Ruby Pix in the mid 1930s and received an award for her lifetime contribution to Indian cinema. Here's another picture of her. And then we have Pramila, Esther Victoria Abraham. She was another Baghdadi Jewess. She was a brilliant scholar and became the headmistress of the Jewish boys school. In 1947, she was the first Miss India and went on to become a film star and one of the first female pre producers, producing over 16 films. Now we have another Rose Maslia and David Abraham Chukur. He was very famous. He was Benny Israel who acted in over 110 films. And, and he had a degree in law and then landed his first role in a movie. It's just amazing. He wrote more than 100 plays. Here we have somebody as exceptional. Um, in the early 20th century, numerous uh, uh, Ben Israel became leaders in the new film industry. And another notable one was Joseph David Penker, a prolific Ben Israel playwright, director, and lyricist. lyricist. He wrote and directed in Gujarati, Hindi, Maharati, and Urdu while being fluent in Hebrew and English. Wow. And now I come to something very special. The incredible achievements of Jack Farage, Raphael Jacob, Jack Jacobs, a Baghdadi Jew who was born in Calcutta in 1924, remain far more than a footnote in history. Jacob enlisted the in the British Indian Army in 1941 at the age of 19 against his father's wishes. He went on to become the highest ranking Indian military commander, eventually commanding the Eastern Army in December 1971 against East Pakistan's legion. To the world's astonishment, 3,000 Indian soldiers accepted the surrender of 90,000 Pakistanis, a truly incredible feat leading to the creation of the sovereign nation of Bangladesh. General Jacobs was known as the midwife at the birth of Bangladesh. And here we see him signing. He's <coughs> of an arrow pointing to him. He, did, he later served as, uh, as governor of two Indian states, Goa and Punjab. 
is your honor chamber the plaque on the wall of honor at ammunition bill which you can see today we seem saluting here again with a war hero with some pride i must add that his father and my mother were first cousins we are deservedly enormously proud of him now my brother-in-law ellis raymond meyer was a leading barrister and a senior advocate in at the Calcutta Bar. Some of his pupil understudies went on to hold high positions in government. He left India and practiced in London. The Calcutta High Court closed for the day when they were informed of his death. Astoundingly, about 10 years later, we had an invitation from one of his former pupils to attend a ceremony for opening a library adjoining the law court in his name. As a this were not enough, a large portrait of Ellis was hung on the wall above the seat, above his in the law court, where it remains. At a banquet, prominent barristers and politicians delivered speeches about how he had influenced and helped them. Somnath Chatterjee, the then speaker of the Lok Sahib, said that Ellis Meyer had been his guru. And here, my, my grandparents, uh, 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 my grandpa's family in Baghdad, and here is my, my parents' wedding. And that's not Gandhi, that's Rabba, Raja Gopalachari, a politician. You can see some pictures of us here in Darjeeling. I went to school in Kersiong convent, and here the girl guides in school uniform. I had the privilege of growing up in Calcutta. My family lived in my paternal grandparents' home where we were brought up to respect our Baghdadi culture and traditions. We celebrated Shabbat and festivals with gusto. A Baghdadi tutor in flowing robes and fairs came to our home. We found him amusing. He taught us individually how to read Hebrew prayers. We attended Rabbi Maslia's Hebrew weekly classes. Our parents were involved in communal work. My grandmother's life revolved around preparations for the cycle of Shabbat and festivals. She spoke Judeo Arabic, English, and Hindi, and wore Baghdadi style clothes, long, loose gowns, and covered her head with a scarf. By contrast, my parents and, and siblings spoke only a few Arabic words and wore trendy Western clothes she spent a considerable part of her day reciting prayers and psalms. We enjoyed a privileged, pampered, leisurely existence facilitated by many sermons. Hospitality is one of our most distinctive, distinctive characteristics. There's a continual stream of guests among them, Hindus, Muslims, and British, and friends just dropped in. The, the cook was trained to prepare Baghdadi cuisine and cater for lavish banquets for over 30 guests. We spoke Hindi, Hindi to our servants. Their quarters were in an outhouse on the premises and they were trustworthy. We had piano lessons and took it in turn to play. We played classical and pop records on a gramophone. Mummy was cultured and fashionable. Although she left school at, at the age of 15, she was well informed and a great conversationalist. When she came to London, she was on the British Board of Deputies. We were a close-knit community, which is not surprising considering, considering Baghdadis were monogamous. They only married Baghdadis. Annual balls, weddings and engagement parties and picnics brought the community together. Social life revolved around our homes, our synagogues and the vibrant Maccabi Club, where we played basketball, hockey, table tennis and badminton. And my claim to fame is that I won the Bengal State Badminton Championship. Under British rule, the Jews of India achieved their maximum population and wealth, and the Calcutta community continued to grow and prosper. Their numbers reached a peak of about 5,000 during World War II, when they were swelled by refugees fleeing from the Japanese advance into Burma and the arrival of Jews from Nazi-occupied Europe. Local Jews enthusiastically contributed to the Jewish Relief Fund and provided them shelter. Many Jewish soldiers fighting for the Allied Army forces arrived in the city. A few married local Jewish girls 
who went to live with their husbands abroad. And many of these Jewish soldiers used to come to our house. We used to love it. We, we girls prevented, pretended that we were in the army and we'd march around and they'd give us these lovely American chocolates on that. We really loved that bit. Okay, now the Second World War was immediately followed by the partition of India. During the great Calcutta killings of 1946, the Jews were not harmed. Many sheltered Hindus and Muslims in their homes to protect them from violent crowds. The exodus of Indian Jews began after the formation of Israel in 1948 and Jews of Calcutta, they were westernized and identified with the British. So they, they want India's independence in 1947 and the rise of nationalism made Jews uneasy. The Jewish population declined dramatically. The less affluent settled in Israel, the majority went to Britain, Australia and America. And after decades of hostility, India's relationship with Israel took a significant turn in, 19, in 1992, when diplomatic relations were established. In recent years, ties have been expanded dramatically with trade increasing from $200 million in 1992 to more than 4 billion in 2016. Israeli, Indian military cooperation has also been increasing, with Israel selling India billions of dollars worth of weapons. The two countries are participating in joint exercises. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was given a ceremonial reception and inspected the Guard of Honor on a six-day visit to India. It, both, it boosted 25 years of diplomatic relations between Israel and India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi was the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Israel in 2017. Now let's take a look at minority communities in India. You can see a Bene is Manasi family. The, Mene, the Bene Manasi community comprised members of the Chinkukimitsu tribe in the northeast Indian state of Manipur and Mitsuram. I think you could see that on that. For generations, they kept Jewish traditions, claiming to be descendants from the tribe of Manasi, one of the 10 lost tribes of Israel that were exiled by the Assyrians in the 8th century BCE. In the 19th century, they were converted to Christianity, but in the 1970s, some of them began practicing Judaism again and set themselves apart from the rest of the community. Rabbi Eli, Eliyahu Avichal named them Bene Menasi. His organization, Amishab, is committed to giving them an orthodox conversion and enabling them to settle in, in Israel. And here you see their flag. In March 2005, Chief Rabbi Shloma Amar recognized them as being of Jewish descent. Nevertheless, they were only granted full citizenship after one year temporary citizenship in Israel and undergoing the process of um, conversion. Since the early 1990s, approximately 3,000 Bene Menasi have emigrated to Israel and another 70,000 are waiting to emigrate. And here we see another community, the Bene Ephraim, and they, uh, I think I'll keep on the map for a bit. They, they number more than 9,000 uh, and are from the northeastern Indian state of Mizorampo and Manipur, which is next to Burma and Assam. They practice a form of biblical Judaism and claim descent from the tribe of Ephraim. They were also called Telugu Jews because they spoke Telugu, the Dravidian national language of India. Baptist missionaries converted them to Christianity at the beginning of the 20th century, but in the, in the 1970s, they began converting to Judaism. Several groups of rabbis visited the community over the years. Thus far, they have not been extended the same recognition as was given to the Bene Manasi. Today, there are few families in Andhra Pradesh. Many follow the customs of Orthodox Jew. The men have long beards, and the women cover their hair all the time. Well, as you can see from this map, 
there are about 20 centers of Chabad Lubavitch centers in India. On the 26th of November in 2008, a series of terrorist attacks shook Mumbai. Among those killed were a Jewish rabbi and his wife at Chabad House. I had the privilege of meeting him and was impressed with the extent they went to provide religious, cultural and educational activities for the community, which included secularized Jews. They sought the provision of kosher food. Guests were always welcome. I'm sure you agree that I've given ample proof of the extraordinary and outstanding legacy of Jews to developing and enriching Indian society. Its enduring impact is incredible considering their minuscule number in the vast subcontinent. On the other hand, it's important to emphasize the many ways India has impacted on the Jews who are privileged to find a home in this vibrant land of opportunity and rich trading potential in which they prospered. Of, from time immemorial, India boasts a long history of hospitality and religious tolerance. As a pluralistic democratic nation, it has long been known as a refugees communities facing oppression elsewhere. Remarkably, religious persecution was unheard of in India at a time when Jews were being victimized and even massacred elsewhere in the world. Jews absorbed some aspect of Indian culture, the friendly, genial hospitality, the language, the laid back leisurely lifestyle, and not least the delicious cuisine, most particularly the spicy curries and mouth watering sweets like zalebis, rasagullas and sondes. They have settled in various parts of the world, but nostalgic memories of their lives in India linger on. I still sing the national anthem with great gusto and say a huge thank you to India, Dhanyabad and Chai Hind. Uh, thank you, which means thank you. And I thank you for your attention. I'd be pleased to answer your questions. It's the most interesting part of my talk. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Maisie. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I feel exhausted having been all around India. <laughs> <laughs> Do you yourself feel nostalgic in any way? Oh, yes. Some, sometimes I certainly do. I, I, I certainly do, especially when I get together with other people who've lived over there and, and we've got these lovely Indian dinners when we're having my favourite with the Indian sweets. They're, they're absolutely beyond anything I've had here. <laughs> no, I, I do get nostalgic. Right, so please everybody do type in your questions if you have any for Maisie. I know we've got several people who've actually been to the places that Maisie has mentioned and uh, uh, I think there's there's one particular question. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. Um, no, Cecilia was married in one of the synagogues you mentioned. Oh, I'd love to hear yeah. more about yeah. Cecilia. Tell us which one. Was it in Bombay or Calcutta? Calcutta might know Cecilia. Cecilia, are you there? Yeah. So, uh, Jay, Jay Prosser, you have um, your mother was actually from Singapore, um, but she was evacuated to Bombay in 1942. And Jay's wondering um, whether uh, Maisie can, can, can say more about um, the evacuation of the Jews from Singapore to Bombay. And uh, do you know anything about the, the compound uh, where they were supposed to have stayed? Well, I do know somebody who, uh, do you know, would you know Moses Cohen and his wife Hilda, because they came from Singapore after they had been in Thailand over there. Um, oh, am I speaking to Cecilia? Yeah. yeah, yeah Maisie, were you in St. Helens Convent? I was. I certainly was. I now, think, I wish I I think we were there together. You have a sister called Sarah? I have indeed. I have indeed. 
And oh, amazing. <laughs> right. What year were you there? Oh my, I can't, I'm a historian. I don't remember dates. No, uh, I, I, it, was, it was, when you were I there, I was we there. there. From 1946 yeah. to 1951. Uh, wow. were, were you in my <laughs> class or my, I had my other sisters there as well. Yeah, you think, uh, my... There were three sisters, right? Florence and Marion were there yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah. I recognized you from the photograph and the wow. school uniform. Yeah. Do you remember the nuns and everything? I got sure I do. Of course I do. Yes. Mm. Well, how That's wonderful, um, isn't it? And um, I don't even know years my, uh, you, you, you also lived in Park Street, didn't you? Yes. 109 yeah. Park Street. And you? Right. Where I remember did you live? That. Yes. Celia, what's, what's your surname? What was your surname? My surname was Maurice. Maurice, and I was Sadka. <laughs> Cecilia Maurice. I remember Cecilia. Sorry. You learned French in school, which is something we weren't doing. There were right? just four of us, four Jewish girls in the convent. Right, and, and you now live in Israel, don't you, Cecilia? No, no, I, yes, I, now yes, I do. Now yes. you do, yes, because I remember you from the Jews of Burma talk we had. That's right, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And so, my brother-in-law, Isaac Abraham, he wrote a book on the Jews of Calcutta. Yeah. I have read that book. It, it, it's, it's not a very yes. big book. Yeah, I've, I've read that. Okay. Well, um, just just a, a little plug for next week's talk, which is going to be about the film stars you mentioned in Bollywood. Uh, actually, because it's such a vast subject, we've asked our speaker, Ken Collins, who I think is on the call, if he's still there, um, to concentrate on the Baghdadi uh, film stars. Uh, so that's something for next week, the 4th of, 4th of May at 7.30. That should be great. I, I think we've got a few more All questions right. Sarah here. Sarah Manasseh and Shula Spain both came up with comments. Should we do yeah. Sarah Manasseh first? And yeah, then Sarah. Sarah. Hey. Hi. Hi. I wonder what you can. Um, I didn't have a question. I think Jay uh, did. Jay ask about Singapore. Yes, um, he did. My father Albert Manasseh, his cousin Helen, was evacuated from Singapore, and I know it was a very difficult journey. They thought that they were not going to make it, mm -hmm. and she was. She left her father and her brothers in Singapore. Um, I think in prison camps or concentration camps, and uh, she didn't ever see her father again. So it was quite a traumatic time then. Right. Uh, Sarah, I can't see you, but perhaps you'd like to tell us about, we were there in Bombay when they had that uh, big celebration in the synagogue, uh, the, the anniversary, and your brother was there from, from America and he was the, the guest speaker. Could yeah. you tell us a bit about that? I think it would be very interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, the, the, I'll just be brief then. Maisie and I were in coaching together for um, um, a conference on the Jews of India, which was a fabulous um, uh, conference. And we then went on to Bombay and we went to both the synagogues, the Magen David synagogue in Baikala, and also the Knesset Eliyahu synagogue in um, Kalaba. Um, there was a very big celebration to which my brother came. He was the late Rabbi Yaakov Menashe. And um, this, this was actually at the Baikala Synagogue. I think, Maisie, that that was um, actually a celebration for one of the Bene Israel synagogues, which was too small. Oh, that to, is true. That's right. The whole, the whole thing. So they had it at the Magen David Synagogue. Exactly. And then the following month, um, was the the great big um, Knesset Eliyahu synagogue, which uh, had been re, uh, revamped, you could say. And um, so that was quite amazing. Anyway. Okay, the next, I think we've got Shula. I wonder what you can tell us about the Maharaja from Gujarat who accepted a boat, which the British did not let land with Jewish children during the Second World War. Um, I don't think I've heard the question very well. Uh, could you could you repeat it, please? I heard that the Maharaja of Gujarat accepted the boat with Jewish 
children during the Second World War and gave them refuge when the British did not permit the boat to land in the British port or in the British Indian port. I'm afraid I don't know anything about it. it sounds very interesting, but I haven't I haven't read that or heard that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And then at, uh, at, during the Second World War, we weren't hearing much about the Maharajas at that time. I don't, I really can't answer that particular question. I'm sorry. No. Yes, I, I know our, ne our speaker next week um, uh, has, has given a talk on refugees who, uh, who found shelter in India during the war, and no, notably the German and Austrian Jewish that's refugees. Right. Yeah. Yes, and uh, no doubt that's a, that's another subject for a lockdown lecture. Um, is cheap but, but what I find very incredible, as I've pointed out a few times, that there was no anti-Semitism to speak of in India. And this uh, in, in 1656, when o Oliver Cromwell uh, readmitted Jews to, uh, to um, England, Jews in Holland noted that in Cochin, Jews were warmly received by the Maharaja, who believed that they would enrich the country. And he had to support them, as we said, with the, uh, the magnificent Paradisi synagogue. But I have to mention this as well. I was really astonished during my research to read this when I was researching about Sir Victor Sassoon. I'm going to quote it. Um, Sir Victor, this, uh, this is somebody who has written this in a newspaper. Sir Victor says that Indians are not putting enough pressure to win the war. He wants drastic measures to be taken against those Indians who are asking for their political freedom and is anxious that the leaf should be taken out of the total, total, totalitarian book. In that case, the victim might himself have long ago been sent into a concentration camp. Even Hitler had a way of dealing with troublesome capitalists. Now, I know he was incensed. This is a politician. I think it's Chandana Bose or something like that. And he, he was incensed with the victim in uh, telling them they'll only get your independence after you have to fight the Japanese and all that. He, they didn't want him interfering. But I think this went, there's, it's not feisty as we would say now. <laughs> okay. okay, Jay. Jay? Jay Kanaba? Uh, oh, I have to unmute. He's you have to. He's unmuted. Can't hear. We can't hear you. <laughs> no, can't hear. Try again. We can't hear you. It's we your can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, next one. Who, who's next, darling? Sorry, but if you want to be in touch with Maisie, just uh, leave your uh, email address on the uh, chat, and I will put you in touch with her. I don't know why we can't hear you, Jay. What's Jay? Yes. No, who, who's unmuted, so I don't yeah. really understand that. Yeah. Jay? Do you, you want to have me? another go, Jay? Hello, Jay? He's disappeared. No. Okay. I, I just want to add something else, Lynn, that yes. I thought of, uh, to show you that everyone was certainly definitely not anti-Semitic at all. Pandit Nero called uh, BNLIs and other prominent business, uh, prominent Jews who were businessmen to a meeting. This is when they were wanting to leave India. And he asked why they were leaving uh, and, uh, uh, you know, leaving India. And he was clearly reluctant to let them go. I mean, they weren't being persecuted or anything. They went of their own volition. Right. Okay. Do you know what's being done to preserve um, the culture of Indian Jews, say in Israel, is there a cultural uh, organization or institute? Restaurants, yes, restaurants. Right, plenty of restaurants. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't, I know uh, Dango used to have the scribe magazines, but that wasn't particularly in, in Israel. No, the yeah. Chinese, uh, the Chinese, uh, the Baghdadi Jews from Shanghai had that paper and the they continued the Israel Messenger, which they had in, in Shanghai. They now do a small version of that, but they keep in touch, but I don't know anything about the Indian doing, doing that. Right. Ah, the, uh, Sarah Manasseh, yes, the I, IJHC Indian Jewish Heritage Center. Oh, Sarah would know. Okay, Sarah well, would know. Brenda, yeah. 
in the spirit gallery wants to speak. Yeah. Uh, is there a presence or a community within the United States that identify as an Indian Jewish community? From your accent, I think you are American, am I right? Okay, <laughs> very much so, yes. So you could tell me that because I, I don't know one, frankly. Maybe, maybe would, would Sarah know? Sarah, do you know? Sarah might know because her brother lived there. Right. Okay, one more question. Among okay. the Sassoons and the other Indian you know, uh, communities, did the, um, the descendants remain Jewish, married amongst Jews? Is there an ongoing Jewish presence in these families that have given the world so much uh, you know, as Jews? Well, sadly with the Sassoon family, our David Sassoon family, uh, there was a lot of uh, marrying non-Jews. Intermarried, yeah. yeah. A lot yeah. of intermarried. And in that particular family, it's only this. Remember, I said they asked him at, at, uh, in Vienna if he was the butler. It's only that family, that branch of the family, that uh -huh. uh, have, have kept it up. David and it's Yitzhak, so soon, um, and David's in Israel. And, you know, they have these the wonderful library. I did most of my research in that. Mm -hmm. and, and also there was uh, Isaac, but they are, they've, they've kept all the traditionals meticulously, they have. Uh, but but I'm not saying that, that uh, I'm Sarah would know that the others that are certainly religious and I mean many of the Baghdadi Jews. I mean I went to a Catholic school and I'm yes. I have two rabbi sons who I'm very proud of and I feel very Jewish. I really do. Good for I, you. I might be learning all that scripture made me realize my own ones were so much better. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You enlightened us. So, you know. It's been a glorious talk. We Thank appreciate you very it. much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, on that lovely note, I think we will bring the meeting to a close. I, I just would like to thank you so much, Maisie, for a most fascinating talk. I think we, will all, we all agree. And uh, don't forget next week, the, um, we continue um, with the Indian theme uh, with Baghdadis in Bollywood. And our speaker, Ken Collins, who will be joining us from Washington, DC. Lovely. Lovely. And, uh, so it just remains for me to thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, to wish you uh, good health and all the best and keep coming to our lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Thank so, you. As is our want, uh, we will now unmute you all to say goodbye or good night uh, and to say whatever you want. <laughs> good night. Thank you. Well, I'll say thank you thank to you. the wonderful else. audience. I really love your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much. Thank you.